I have one announcement to make this morning, and that is um, Second Lieutenant uh, Caleb Hare from the United States Marine Corps is with us. Caleb. We, we could not be more proud of him, I can tell you. We love him and are so extremely proud. And I asked him to say a few words, but the Corps doesn't allow them to be live streamed. And so I thought what we'll do is as soon as we end, uh, we'll have the uh, video stopped, the live streaming, and you can come up and say a few words there, okay? <laughs> Okay, let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and during that time we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can be here and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, the living Savior and our God. We're glad that we have this time of year where people normally don't hear the name of Jesus, hear it. We thank you that you gave us the gift above all gifts, which is your Son, and we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate this morning as we indeed fo focus on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his birth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you would think that the birth of the Son of God would be grandiose and pomp and uh, full of uh, fanfare, but that was not the case. In fact, it was just the opposite. It was an average day when people are going around doing their regular thing, when Jesus Christ, the one who created the heavens and the earth, was born, and hardly anyone noticed. That's the way God would have it. Why would he put pomp and circumstance to anything on earth? Because where he lives and where Jesus lives, that would be, what could we say, Mickey Mouse? He's unique within uh, the entire universe. There's no one like our Lord. He is both God and man. He's 100% deity and true humanity, 100% humanity, uh, united together in one person. He is the one and only God-man. We call that the hypostatic union. And so when you talk about Jesus Christ, there's no one like him. I mean, you can say that with, with vigor because he is indeed unique. The first mention of God that he provides salvation for mankind is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where Jesus Christ was referred to as the seed of the woman and that Satan would bruise or wound him on the heel, and Jesus would bruise or crush Satan on the head. Here it is up on the board for you as well, and I've put in parentheses some um, entries that will help you to understand it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Uh, 
This is when God was disciplining Satan and Adam and Eve. But we start with here with him disciplining and cursing Satan. And I, referring to God, will put enmity between you, that would be the serpent and Satan, Satan is called a serpent in Revelation. We'll get to that next. And I, God, will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed, that would be Satan's seed, and Satan's seed is unregenerate mankind, those that have rejected the gospel, and her seed, that would be the woman's seed. Now, the woman's seed is very unusual because genealogy is traced in the Bible through the man. But it wasn't used here because it had been inappropriate because Jesus Christ did not have a human father. Had he had a human father, he would not be qualified to go to the cross because he would be tainted with the old sin nature. So, let's start again. And I, God, will put enmity between you, serpent, or Satan, and the woman, and between your seed, that would be Satan's seed, which is unregenerate mankind, and her, the woman's seed, that would be Jesus Christ. And he, Jesus, shall bruise your, that would be Satan, on the head. The word bruise there uh, would be crushed. And and you, Satan, shall bruise, that would be wound him, Jesus Christ, on the heel. Now what we're going to see is that, of course, when you crush the head, that is a fatal blow. But when you're wounded on the heel, it's not fatal. And that, of course, the wounding of, the, of Christ on the hill refers to the cross. But Jesus Christ rose from the grave. This verse is about the angelic conflict that went on before the earth was created and continues even to this moment. The ongoing war between good and evil and between God's people and Satan. It's the first mention of God's plan for eternal salvation of mankind in the Bible. So if we're going to talk about Jesus Christ and his birth, then I think that would be something that we need to understand as well. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, and the dragon, if you want, I'll wait till you turn there if you want to, Revelation chapter 12 or 17. Okay, Revelation twelve seventeen, And the dragon, a reference to Satan, was enraged with the woman. And the woman here is referring to regenerate Israel. Because here in Revelation you have the time that Satan is desperate. What he wants to do more than anything is obliterate every Jew off the face of the earth because he figures that if he could annihilate all the Jews then God uh, would have lied when he made promises to the Jews that would be the Abrahamic covenant for unconditional covenants that 
are going to take place at the second advent. And so he's trying to kill all the Jews, and if, if you can't fulfill it because there's no Jews, then you can't fulfill your promise. That's what he's trying, and that's why he is desperately trying to annihilate all the Jews, and this would be during the tribulational period. And the dragon, Satan, was enraged with the woman, regenerate Israel, that would be believing Israel, Israelites, and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, that would be the remnant of Israel, that would be the believers as well, believing Jews, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, and they were, that means they were imitating Christ through what they said and what they did or will do. We should do the same, shouldn't we? Imitate Christ in his righteousness. Now this is going to look odd to you at first, and I'll explain it to you. This is something that one of the slides that I had from when I taught the Star series this Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is one of the um, things that we see when I taught uh, God's message in the stars. Now, this is not astrology. Astrology is Satan's counterfeit of the real message in the stars that I taught. Uh, did, do anybody remember how long ago that was about? Two decades, maybe? The Star Series? Oh, it was more than that. Seven years? Oh, it's just seven years then. It just feels like two decades. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, what this is, let me do a little explaining. There's an invisible arc or, or circle around the earth. Uh, it's called a Masroth in the Bible by Job. It's also known in, if, I don't know if you can see it here. This word here is the ecliptic, this, this word, this dotted line going through here. And it's an invisible, uh, circle around the earth. And that's where the sun, the moon, and all the planets are on that circle. They are, uh, it's also called, um, the zodiac. And, the zodiac is just another term for it. You have 12 constellations that fall right on that ecliptic, and they're called the signs of the zodiac. Now, again, I'm just saying for reference so you'll understand what I'm talking about. This particular one, there's 12 of them, um, is signifying what we just saw. It's illustrating... Where's my, here it is. The constellation that we're looking at is here, Scorpio, the scorpion. And that is the main constellation because it is falls on this ecliptic. And every one of the 12 constellations that are located in this uh, ecliptic, this uh, invisible circle, have three other constellations that are associated with it. Actually, what they do is tell more, give you more information about why this uh, particular co constellation is there. So, scorpion. Who who do you think that the scorpion represents? Satan. Yeah, right. And so here you have three others. You have Aphiuchus. And you have serpents, serpents, and you have Hercules. And so, what, 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 do, what are these decans? What are they talking about? How do they help uh, see what's going on with this constellation of Scorpio? Well, of course, uh, Aphiuchus is called the serpent ha handler. He's got control of the serpent, and. Ser uh, serpents, of course, is the uh, represents Satan as well, and look what he's reaching up here to get. That's Corona Borealis, which is uh, or Corona, 
which is the constellation of Libra, and he's reaching for the crown, and Ophiuchus here is keeping him from reaching the crown. He also has his foot on the head of the serpent, I mean, of the scorpion. You see how that depicts what we just saw? And there's much more I could tell you about these things, um, but I'm, I'm going to try to keep it uh, just for this. And Hercules up here has his foot, I think it's on a dragon. He's upside down there. Now, if you take away the artwork, you see just the stars. And so it's not the configuration of these stars that make that really tell what's going on. It's the names of the stars. And the star names uh, are the ones that give you the information. And I would give you these when I taught this. I taught these stars and told you what they were about. But here um, it, with Scorpion, you have the tail that can go up. And this, this word here, uh, Liath, means to strike or to... Uh, to, I, I think it means you have know, to strike, like you, the, the tail go up here and strike him on the heel. And here he has the uh, scorpion stepping on it on his head. Now, Scorpio, that particular constellation speaks of moral conflict: Christ, the sufferer, and the victor. So Christ suffered, but he also had victory. And this is part of the angelic conflict, the ongoing war that is shown here. And I show the Deccans. You have serpents, which the serpent struggles with the seed of the woman. That's what serpents is presenting. Ophiuchus, the mighty one, handles the serpent. He's keeping him from reaching and getting the crown. And you've got Hercules, the mighty man, humbled yet victorious. Now, by the way, you can go to our website, countrybiblechurch.us, and over on the series side, you can go down and see the star series, and it's all there in, 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 the, um, in the notes. However, you can also go to the visuals and find the star, uh, star series there as well, and that's all of the PowerPoints where you get all of the uh, great pictures and so forth showing what, what, is, what it's all about. Now the star Antares, remember this, I want to show you where that, that star is. It's right here. Antares, this is the name of the star, and it's the one that he has his foot on. And I... I have a lot, a whole, a whole lot more information, but I'm just giving you an idea. The star Antares means the wounding, for Jesus Christ was wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripe we are healed. That's explaining that. And this star is the brightest star in Scorpio. It's 1,000 light years away. Now, let me explain something about uh, these light years. Light travels 160,000 uh, miles per second, rounding it off. And when you have 1,000 light years, just one, one light year would be how far uh, light would travel at 160,000 miles per second. Did I say m per hour a while ago? I did say second, okay. Per second. So in, this is another idea of how fast it's traveling. When you, let's say you hit the flashlight, you hit a beam, that speed, that flashlight, if you could put it to go around the world, would go around the world six and a half to seven times in one second. That's how fast it's traveling. And in one year, how many seconds are there in one year? I don't know how many there are. <laughs> That's how it would go 
how far it would go in one year, think how far that would be, and this is 1,000 light years away, just to give you a little idea. And uh, it's the 15th brightest star in the sky. It is a red giant. It's 350 times larger than our sun. Now, our sun is an average star. And if you took the planet Earth and put it on one side of the sun, and you went all the way across to the other side of the Earth, uh, not around, just the, the diameter of the Earth, uh, of the sun, and you stacked the Earth going all the way across the diameter, how many do you suppose, how many times it would fit? Anybody got an idea? I guess? Huh? A thousand miles? A thousand? A thousand Earths? 100,000 Earths is what it would take to span the diameter of the sun. So when it says this star in Teres is 350 times larger than our sun, that's one big star. Uh, when you get to the constellation, you'll, you will, the, the uh, next constellation, you will understand the significance of this star and its name. Now, I have a few um, PowerPoints here I'm just going to flick through because I want to make sure I get on with where I'm, I'm trying to get in to, to get to. And if I get time, I'll come back to these, okay? I'm just going to go through these. Okay, the birth of Jesus Christ was heavily prophesied in the Old Testament. These are a few of the prophecies. You're probably familiar with them. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means? Okay. God with us. God is with us. Isaiah 9, 6, For a child will be born to us. Now, what that means is Jesus Christ was born in a normal fashion. When Mary had him, she delivered a child just like mothers deliver children. It was normal. But when Jesus Christ was born... He had no old sin nature, and he was born trichotomous, the body, soul, and spirit, whereby we are not. We're born dichotomous, meaning we just have a body and a soul. We do not have a spirit because uh, the imputation of Adam's sin is... Uh, makes us born physically alive and spiritually dead. So a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. What son might that be? The Son of God was given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and the Prince of Peace. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathra, too little to be among the clans of Judah. It was a very small town, and there was more than one town called Bethlehem. So this is the one in Ephrathra. For, one, for, for you, one, and that's capital H, uh, capital O, will go forth from me to rule, to be ruler in Israel, the goings forth, are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So Jesus Christ was going to be born in Bethlehem, and this particular prophecy was made 700 years before it came to pass. If you could, if you could try to guess 700 years from now, and let's just pretend, and this is a big pretend. Let's pretend that the United States of America will still be here 700 years from now. But 
and you were going to predict that a certain person was going to be born, let's say the president, 700 years from now, and not only were you going to know who he was, but you also knew where he was going to be born. Now, what's the chance of you coming up with an accurate prognostication with that? It's no problem for God, though. See, he did it. No problem. Okay, the birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. No other event has ever impacted the world in the way that Jesus Christ's birth has. Even our calendar is separated by his birth, although it is off a few years. A bit of background. The events of the day when Christ was born were alarming. The Caesars were holding on to power through force and despotism. The enemies of Rome were a constant annoyance and required special attention. Herod, who ruled Judah, was charged to keep the Jewish people in line and the Eastern Front secure. To maintain his military strength, Herod, through Quirinius' directive, was required to take a census. This undertaking compelled a young couple to return to Judah specifically the little town of Bethlehem. Once there, the betrothed Mary gave birth to the supernaturally conceived King of Kings. I just want to stop a a moment and think about Mary. When the angel came to her and told her what was going to happen, she was, they, they estimate she was probably around 15 or 16 years old. And to have an angel sent from God to give you a specific message. And then when she heard what the message was, that she had been chosen to bear the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Can you imagine her trying to wrap her mind around that? But then at that same time, she had big problems because she was engaged to Joseph. And In those days, an engagement was as binding as the marriage itself. For if you were engaged to someone and you committed uh, fornication or maybe adultery in this case, they could execute you. And she had a problem with with her fiancé. How do you go to your fiancé and say, "Uh, I've got good news, but it's not going to sound good to you? and say, I'm pregnant. And, of course, he he would be devastated. He was devastated. And then she said, but but it's no man. I I, I didn't have, uh, let me put it this way, I'm still a virgin, but I'm pregnant. I'm sure the average person would roll their eyes. Mm Mm-hmm, that's a good one. So she had to deal with that. And then, of course, Joseph, by the way, we're looking at two Joseph. We're looking at Joseph, uh, the son of Jacob, in our study of uh, major Bible events. What a phenomenal person he was. And Joseph, the husband of Mary, was that same caliber. Anyway, uh, and then they had to go from Bethlehem, I mean from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem, that long trip, and that when she got there, of course, there wasn't a room. And so you know about all of this. So uh, I just want to say something about Mary there. Mary had to be a very special person for God to choose her. He just, we don't know why he did, but he had his reasons and we know. And unfortunately, there have been so many uh, untruths said about her and people who want to worship her instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not her fault. But anyway, I was just thinking of of making that trip, getting to Bethlehem, and she knew she was probably have the Messiah any moment. Anyway, I thought that was worth pointing out. Now, back to the background. The Parthians had a class of people who could read the stars and understand them. 
They were descendants of the great seers of Babylon called the Magi. Now, in Babylon is where, you remember, you had, um, who was it? Um, Daniel. You had Daniel was uh, exiled to, he wasn't exiled. Uh, the Jews were conquered by the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, and they took them all back to um, Babylon, and that's where uh, he was there for 70 years. And Daniel was phenomenal, phenomenal in what he's, what he did. You know, he's, uh, was able to uh, translate the dream of, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and so forth. But he was, they, they, there's information saying that he was part of this, uh, group of Magi. And so, you see the Parthians here, you have uh, the Persians uh, conquered Babylon, and Persia is part of the uh, Parthenon, uh, Parthenian, um, it, they had several countries in it, and Persia was one of them. And so actually the Magi came from Persia, and these Magi were Rome's enemies, and were a constant threat as they uh, intended to conquer land on the Mediterranean uh, Sea's eastern shore uh, land, such as Ju Judea. So we're going to see what happens about that. The Roman Senate had declared Herod king of the Jews around 37 B.C., and he ruled the client nation of Judah from that time until shortly after Christ was born. One day, several magi came to him from the east, probably from Parthia, where is, is part of the a group there of Persia, and asked him where the king of the Jews was born. Well, think about that. You have already Herod that was installed to be the king of the Jews, and he's got these guys coming all this way, and they want to know where is it that the king of the Jews is being born. Do you think he was a happy camper about that? I think not. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 gives us the information on that. Matthew 2, 1 through 3. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Well, I think it was a bit, a bit of an understatement that he was troubled. The request of these enemy seers to show the way to a potential replacement king caused Herod to blow his top. And that he did. They say that Herod was troubled uh, was the understatement of the century. He freaked out. He was livid. He sent probably hundreds of male babies two years old and younger to their deaths in order to exterminate this so-called king of the Jews who would dare threaten his reign. Can you imagine the brutality? Can you imagine if you were a mother living under Herod's uh, jurisdiction and you just you had a male baby that was maybe one year old or two years old or whatever it was? Can you imagine the horror knowing that they're coming for, for your son? That's how upset Herod was about this. To say that Herod was troubled was an understatement of the century. I think I just had that, didn't I? Yeah, I had that and I had it again. So Joseph's family fled to Egypt, financed by the Magi. So when the Magi came, they brought gifts. And the, these gifts were to pay homage of the king of the Jews. In fact, he was the king of kings. He was the Messiah. And so they gave him these gifts, and uh, 
God had it in his plan that when you had Herod killing all the male babies that they could escape and go to uh, Egypt and there they would be protected and they had the money to travel and to stay there for however how long they needed to go. That had to be there. So Joseph's family fled to Egypt financed by the Magi and took refuge there for Herod had no jurisdiction to pursue beyond the borders of his province. After Herod's death, the divine family was able to return to Judea, settle in Nazareth, and raise their son who would one day take away the sins of the world. Now, by the way, when Mary and Joseph had to go into uh, essentially a uh, a stall, um, they call it a manger, because there was no room in the inn. And when you see these, uh, these, stat what do you call those things? The, um, where they, they picture Mary and Joseph at the, uh, at the manger. Yeah, yeah I know, but there's a nativity. Yeah. A crash? That's what I was looking for, a crash. Uh, anyway, when you see those, the people mean well, but most of them are not accurate because they usually have three wise men. This would be the Magi, and we have no idea how many there may have been. There may have been uh, 10, 50, 100. We don't have any idea, but we see we three kings, so we have to stick to three. Also, when they came, they weren't in a manger. This was two years later, and they came to the house. And so, again, we want to be as accurate as we can. Have, has anybody ever seen an accurate... Uh, and I'm not putting it down. I, I know I'm going to get a hate mail for this for trying to belittle it. But I'm just trying to be accurate so that you will understand this didn't happen all at the same time. The, the, the shepherds and the Magi, and all, this didn't all go to the manger and it all happened there. So, one day, he would take away the sins of the world. God was working behind the scenes to fulfill his plan. Everything that I've said so far was building up to the next few slides. This is what I want you to take away. So God was working behind the scenes to fulfill his plans. He moved the heart of a pagan king to order a census, which forced Joseph and Mary to travel to Bethlehem. He motivated the Magi to find them and give them gifts which would fund their temporary trip to Egypt, which saved them from the slaughter of baby boys ordered by Herod. He let Joseph know that it was safe to return home after Herod had died. These things were not just willy-nilly events that just happened to be. They are the fulfilling of God's plan working behind the scene. Of course, he is still working behind the scene to fulfill his plans. It appears that he is allowing mostly pagan leaders around the world to oppress their own people on a scale which we haven't seen in our lifetime. This could be a foreshadowing of what has been prophesied for the not too distant future. Is the world's population being prepared to submit to the horrible things that are yet to come? Things such as not being able to buy or sell without a mark of the beast without some kind of card to show. One world government, cashless society, tyranny, mayhem, chaos, and genocide. Is that what we're being prepared for? We don't know for certain what lies ahead but we do know for certain that whatever unfolds in the days, months, and years to come, God will be working behind the scenes to protect us 
and to provide for all of our needs, just as he did for Joseph and Mary and the other Joseph, who God rose to be the prime minister of Egypt in order to save the family of Jacob from a seven-year drought. Don't ever doubt that God is working on your behalf. And sometimes things happen and we think they're horrible. We wish they wouldn't happen. But we don't have to ask why did these things happen because God allowed them in order to fulfill his plan. You'll remember when I was, when I got to the part of Joseph and he had been for 20 years, he had been, uh, he th was thrown in a pit, in a pit, he was sold to slavery, he went to Egypt, he was working for Potiphar, uh, he was a slave, his Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him and lied and said that he was made a, a, a sexual attempt to rape her. And so then he was thrown in prison. All of this was totally undeserved. And throughout it all, you never have a record of him complaining one time. And the reason was because he knew that God was working in the background to bring about a dream that he had when he was 17 years old. And he kept trusting that God is working all things together for good. And when Joseph had shown that he passed all these tests, then God elevated him to the next stage of his plan for Joseph's life. And that he's what he's doing for you and he's doing for me as well. And when we start complaining and whining and getting angry and being fearful, all those things keep us from allowing God to raise us up to that next level in the plan he has for us. Each one of us has a own specific plan from God. And so when we see these things, our first inclination is to be angry or to be afraid or complain, but we have to jettison that, get rid of it, and start applying the doctrines that you've been taught that this is God testing you to see if you're going to trust him through the whole ordeal and when you continue to do that, then you're ready for the next level and he promotes you. And that promotion is going to re uh, result in rewards and decorations and crowns and privileges for all eternity. So that is the Christmas message. That is what we want to do is to imitate Jesus Christ and these two Josephs. And when we do then we will be good and faithful servants of the Most High. Let's see what time I have. I have five minutes. Do you all want to see those other uh, things I had? Yes. It was literally the dreams. God didn't talk to him, didn't have any of that. and uh, But he held on to it because he knew that it, it had to be God uh, speaking to him. Yeah. Yeah, we had two dreams. Yeah, right, 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 one right after the other. Uh -huh. Well, let me say what, uh, so the people online will know. I was asked if when Joseph, Jacob's son, uh, went through all these uh, hardships and trials and so forth, was the only thing he had to draw strength from was from the two dreams that he had when he was 17 years old. And the answer is, yes, that's all he had. There's no record of him getting something special from God. <clears throat> so he was just, he knew that all this had to be for a purpose. And through all that time, he hung on to that. And because he 
had what we would call a divine viewpoint and not human thinking, which is stinking thinking. Uh, God promoted him. He was the prime minister of Egypt. And he, uh, we're going to see how a comparison of his life to Jesus' life in probably next week or the next one. Yes. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, it's ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, the question has to do with uh, Joseph is an Old Testament believer who was aware that God spoke to believers, at least uh, through dreams and visions and various things. Through so his father, have, yeah. Mm-hmm. So he would have a different situation since God does not do that since a completion of Scripture. He doesn't appear and speak and do those things, right? Right. What's your question? Well, his uh, my the question leans into hers in that he was confident of a dream, which we should not be. But oh, he yeah, was confident yeah. in mm-hmm. these dreams. He mm-hmm. knew they came from God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the dream that he had could only be made by God. I mean, you know, for him to have these dreams. I'm, sh- I don't, I'm sure he had other dreams from time to time, but this one was, these two were significant. And he couldn't even hold them in. He had to tell his family, and that's when everything started going downhill. His brothers were not fond of him anyway because Joseph, Jacob had shown partiality to him with the uh, coat of many colors. And so when he said that one of the dreams was that uh, there were uh, these corn stalks would come up high and there would be good ones and then there were all these bad ones and it, the dream would reveal that they would bow down the the the, the Bad looking stalks, the weak ones, would bow down to the, to the, uh, to this one, to the stalk that was well healthy. And what it meant that his brothers were going to be subservient to him. And that made them jealous and angry enough to try to kill him, and which they tried to do. But he also knew how to interpret the dream accurately. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's see what we got here. We've got two minutes. Now, I don't have to be, I don't, I'm not on the clock that much, but I'm just, does anybody else have a question before I go on to the other? Yes. Can you? It's Cindy. Oh, <laughs> thought you were going like this. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll go back to those and I'll explain this to you. Uh, I'll try to do it quickly in about two, two minutes. Okay. You, you saw what I had about this. Now, now, notice the bottom of this. It says, you will under, um, when we get to the next constellation, which is Sagittarius in the, in the way that they are in order, you will understand the significance of the star and its name. This is talking about Antares that we were talking about a while ago. And so this is one that I was, I'm going to explain to you. This is another shot. I put this together, several of them, of actually, see this foot? This would go up there, and he's got his foot on the head of this uh, Draco, the dragon. But... Um, here you have Antares, which is the uh, heart of the scorpion or around the head area. And here you have Sagittarius. And Sagittarius depicts Jesus Christ as the author. And don't get upset because he's got a, a animal body and a, a human top. This portrays the um, what we were talking about earlier, which is the uh, humanity and the deity of Christ, these two different th- people or things in one, uh, bo- in one person. So this is what this is showing, and he's got the 
the arrow pulled here, see, the archer, look where it's headed. The, the star in Terry's. And so that's what that was talking about. I just want to let you know. Um, I got another one here to show you. Now this is what Antares, if you look at the star structure, this is what it looks like. But the name of the stars is what fills in the rest of this picture. And it's not an accident that you have this depicting Jesus Christ and he's got that arrow aimed. It's, it's knocked. That's what we call it. It's in the string, that arrow. And he's aiming it at the heart of the a scorpion. And one more here. This is how you can identify it. Can y'all see that? Okay. What the, the circle here? There's a teapot in there. I'll sh I'll, I'll, this is the bottom. This is the handle. This is the top. And this is the spout. Do you see it? I'll do it one more time. It's, it's, it's right here. Come on. There you go. It's right here. I'll start with the bottom, and there's a hand. This is the bottom. This is the handle that you hold the teapot with. This is the top of the teapot, and here's the little lid on top. This is the spout going back down the bottom. You see that? That's part of Scorpio, but that's what it looks like if you're just looking at the stars. And I remember what got me so really motivated to study the stars and astronomy and so forth was in, uh, oh, probably 30, I don't know how many years, 40 years ago, I don't know. Uh, we were outside, Carrie and I were outside, and she said, look, there's the teapot. I said, the teapot? She said, yep, in the sky. Oh, and I, I, I was, where is it? And she finally uh, described it and pointed to where I could see, that's a teapot. And, and I, th I didn't know that it was Sagittarius. I thought it was a teapot. But anyway, it got me really interested that the things in the in the uh, sky, these things are like images. And it, you can go to in Psalm 19, one, 19, 1, the heavens are declaring the glory of God and then it starts talking about the stars and how they give God's message. In Romans chapter 10, you have... The people saying, well, we don't know because we don't, we don't know doctrine because uh, we don't have a teacher. And Paul says, oh, yes, you do. And then he goes to uh, Psalm 19, and it goes around and talks about how the stars are communicating without a sound and so forth. So anyway, if you want to check what I'm talking about, uh, go to the website and go to the series of the stars are the notes. And if you go to the visuals and you go down to the uh, stars uh, in the visuals, it's in alphabetical order. It's got a tremendous number of uh, PowerPoints on the stars. Okay? Okay, I'm, I'm going to close now. I'll say a prayer. And I want to say before that, Merry Christmas to you which is nearly a week away. <laughs> and then we're going to have Caleb come up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful of who and what you are. We're in awe of who you are and what you have done in the past, what you're doing now and what you'll be doing in the future. We pray that you will help us, even in our darkest moments, to remember that you are with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You love us with a love that is immeasurable and that you are working all these things in our life in order for us to go to the next level in our growing, our spiritual growth, and that we will look forward to the time when we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ face to face. We'll be eternally grateful that he was born and that he went to the cross, paid for the sins of the world, and also that he rose from that cross and now is our living Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Caleb. Vidal, you, you killing it?